love him or hate him, you had to respect him. He was a wonderful leader for that time. It's what we needed, somebody to pull us all together. I can't think of any other man who could have done, who could have led us the way Churchill led us. He had such charisma. He was a little bit egotistical. He thought, you know, his decisions were the only decisions worth following through. But on the whole, my goodness, he, he got us, kept us on our feet. A great, great, great leader. He was a brave man, and at a time when he had the Pisas in the in the cabinet, and Winston Churchill had stuck out and he'd stuck by his guns, when it seemed that negotiating with the Germans for a peace was the only way to go, but uh, he knew there was another way, and he went that way. Love him or hate him, you had to respect him. He was a wonderful leader for that time. It's what we needed somebody to pull us all together, because he never promised us anything we didn't get. Blood, toil, tears, sweat. He never promised us anything fancy. We never got anything fancy. But we'd have followed him to the ends of the earth because he was so determined, was that man. Our family admired Churchill tremendously, and he used to do these broadcasts. The whole family would gather round the fire and uh, listen to, I think, every one of Churchill's broadcasts, and they were very inspiring, and um, I read them now about we all fight on the beaches, we all fight in the hills and everything. I think they made a great difference to everyone's morale. And Churchill from time to time spoke on the BBC French service and, and the morale of the French shot up because, I mean, he, he would say, je vais parler français, you know, and, and people found that inspiring. I mean, oh yes, he was, he was our hero too. I mean, absolutely, yes. We had to go to Chequers um, one day to record Churchill. We were told to get there at 10 o'clock, so we did. But he still hadn't had his bath, so we had to wait until he got himself organised. Then he came down, did his interview, and I, the, the, the guy in front like what they call a microphone operator, he sort of put a mic up on a stand. Um, he, he had the temerity to sort of tell, tell Churchill he was sibilant. That didn't go down very well with Churchill. He said, what does that mean? He said, have you got it? Have you recorded it? And he said, yes. Yeah, well, that's it then. Good day. Very cross. But he was, he was the person, he was a man of his time. At the beginning of this period of warfare, uh, it is on record that Germany initially were chiefly bombing industrial centres, factories and so on. And I understand that whilst they were bombing London, they did actually bomb a civilian place. And from then onwards, of course, 
the, the Allies, the British, started bombing Germany. Now, I think the total civilian deaths in the Blitzes was somewhere about 80,000, which is a shocking thing, of course. But in one bombing raid on Hamburg, more people were killed than all the civilians killed in the whole of the war in this country. The principle of killing people just to achieve a political aim in the, in that, to that extent is just wrong. I never saw him until I was in the Wrens. And then um, down at Dover, I came out of our tower and saw Churchill coming up the cliff with all the staff officers. And to see Churchill at eight o'clock in the morning was the most astonishing thing. Of course, he was very distinctive to look at. And I think even in a whole bunch of army officers, I immediately saw Churchill. If you saw senior officers, um, you saluted, but you were no, only allowed to salute when wearing a hat. Well, of course, if you'd been on overnight watch um, in case uh, you were needed to do direction finding, you were wearing a seaman's jersey, and when I came out of the house of duffel coat and no hat, um, and so I couldn't salute, and the only thing I could think of doing, seeing Churchill and all these officers, was to wave and say, hello, good morning, everybody. And they all waved back and said, good morning. And then they went on up and stood on the cliff and looked across at Calais. Yeah, there's a, a couple of times uh, that uh, I had to go to 10 Downing Street to pick up the dispatch box uh, to take it to Chequers. So uh, I did that for the, uh, for the Prime Minister. Well, there were no gates on Downing Street at that time. So you drove your motorbike up to the door. There would be a policeman on the door and uh, he would ring the bell and the doorman would, uh, would come or the, the butler or, 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 or a servant and uh, he would take the box from you and then take it into, uh, I suppose, the secretary, the private secretary. I, I didn't see him personally. <laughs> he didn't confide in me. But uh, yes, I thought it was, I thought it was great, Winston Churchill. He used to come and he used to play a lot of bazique with my mother, I remember. That was almost at the end of the war, or just after the war, and he used to come and paint. And I remember one night that he... It was after he made a big speech, I think, at Blenheim. It must, must have been about 47 that he spent the weekend at Blenheim with Menzies, who was the Australian Prime Minister then. And I remember my mother saying to me, because I, I was about 17 then, I suppose, 16 or 17, um, I'm going to go to bed now, and will you stay up and see that they have everything they want in the way of drinks or cigars or something, and um, see that the lights are turned off when they go to bed. And I had to sit around for about, I don't know, three, three hours, just being there to see if, looking after them, really. And I suppose I should have been sitting there listening to all their words of wisdom, but of course at 17 I probably wasn't. I saw him on the balcony at Buckingham Palace. I was up in London for VE Day and great crowds of us made for the palace and we celebrated. Churchill was going to speak at three o'clock 
and they put the uh, speakers in the Royal Square. And I desperately wanted to be down there. Uh, that was emotion, a emotion you you'd never, never b believe. Um, everybody was shaking hands and smiling and laughing, and, and then suddenly we heard the loudspeakers starting to crackle, and you could have heard a pin drop, and we were all listening. I remember hearing uh, the magic hour of three o'clock on that day, Big Ben and the town church clock. We were then, it was just silent expectation. We were waiting for what I call him, our hero of the moment, that was Churchill. And of course we listened intensely and when he mentioned our dear channel house, of course it went out in a roar. Ha! Yes. <laughs>